So now we invite um, Rebecca Retzel to come forward to light the chalice and lead us in our affirmation of covenant, which is in your order of service. Okay. Good morning. I brought Luke with me to help. This morning we light the chalice with words from the disability rights activist Judith Human, who passed away March of this year. Our anger was a fury sparked by profound injustices, wrongs that deserved ire. And with that rage, we ripped a hole in the status quo. May this light remind us to funnel our rage against injustice into action to make positive changes in the world. Please join me in the affirmation of covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament, and service is prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, and now Sky Brower, who is a member of our eighth principal team, will now tell us about the eighth principal quest. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good morning. Is this on? There we go. All right, cool. Well, we are really excited about this. In fact, I wanted to mention first off that a philosopher with a cat very recently said, encouraged us to come out of our boxes, interrupt our routines, form different habits, discern new patterns, and reorganize our thoughts. And this was in reference to the eighth principle. So with that, and that's why I'm so excited to be here because we are a church of action, not just words. We really want to change our lives. We want to change the way we do things. So the Eighth Principal Committee is so pleased to announce the launch of our long-awaited Eighth Principal Quest. You'll find a copy of this in your bulletin. Uh, all credit for the beautiful design goes to Sarah Hyman, who's incredibly talented. Uh, it's, it, it's just, I couldn't be more pleased with it. So the Eighth uh, principal, principal Quest is actually, it's a tool designed to help us either individually or in small groups increase our knowledge, raise our awareness, and facilitate meaningful cross-racial relationships. It's gonna be published quarterly by season. This is the fall edition. There'll be one for winter. Each one's gonna be a little different. And this edition has a theme. The theme for this one is black-owned business. So how many times have you been in a conversation and you've heard someone say, I support black business, and then inevitably the response will come, well, why does it have to be black business? Why can't, it, why can't we support all business? And when we think about that, do we also hear the same type of logic applied when we talk about history or lives, black history or black lives? So we want to take you on this little journey. This is a little introduction. The way the quest works is this time we have a section of local history, and these four things are designed to be done uh, in order one at a time. You want to try and accomplish all of them, and you have the full season to do it. So I really encourage, don't try to rush through it. Don't try and knock it all out in a day. It starts with a documentary. Watch the documentary. It's a little less than an hour. Then meditate on it. Think about it. And then go on to the next step. Maybe the next day. Maybe the next week. Maybe a couple weeks from then. After that, there are some businesses you can support. When you're doing the history tour, think about a few things. Think about why are there black businesses? What was the need? What brought this about to where black communities needed to have their own economic sphere? And what was the white response to black success and black entrepreneurship? And then finally, what can we do differently today to help support and change harms of the past? So really, uh, we're really excited to introduce this quest. We hope everyone enjoys it. Uh, there's a copy in the bulletin. It's also published in the weekly newsletter. 
should be in the outer circle. And there's a QR code on the screen. Normally, I'd never encourage anyone to pull out their smartphones in church, but if you, if you pull up your camera and zoom in on the QR code, you'll get a link. You can pull it up that way. One little small tip. When you go and you have encounters, make small talk with people, owners, staff, patrons. Introduce yourself, ask for names, and then here's a tip. Try and remember people's names. Now, I'm getting a little bit older. I have to take notes. I don't let a lot of people know that, but as soon as I'm out of view so I don't look suspicious, I'm like tapping down notes on people's names. And then before I go into that establishment the next time, I take a peek at my notes. I go in there, hey, Clarence, how you doing? You know, it'll make the experience so much richer. People really appreciate being seen and heard, as we all do. And, uh, and you'll just have a blast doing it. So uh, that is pretty much it. Uh, one other thing I want to give a quick plug, eighth principle plug for uh, Margot Cameron's eighth principle uh, class on white fragility. I've taken it before. It's a phenomenal journey. It's not an easy topic. It's not going to be a fun class. But you're going to, you're, uh, I tell you what, when we embrace reality, it's very freeing than trying to maintain illusion. So I highly encourage you. It starts on September 11th. Yes, that's an easy date to remember. Uh, Mondays, 5.30. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, and happy questing. on listen to this assistance it made me so much louder it did. It really did. thanks interesting thing about that um a lot of people use a lot of things that make their lives a lot easier uh i wonder if we could think of a few of those things Hearing aids, yes. Earplugs are very helpful, indeed. What was that? Tennis shoes. Tennis shoes, yeah, they assist me. They make me real fast. What else? Glasses, we got spectacles. Notes in your phone. Dogs, yes, that is an assisted technology for sure, given by the grace of God. <laughs> Dentures, yes. Very, very helpful in chewing. Yes. ADHD medication. We were just discussing that this morning. I don't know if you know. <laughs> Some of us are afflicted. Um, here. Okay. Yeah, and, and so I think that what we're where we're getting at is that all of the cars. 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 Right? And anybody. Buses in my case. Buses. Yes. Yeah. Buses. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think that what we're getting at today is that nobody got here today, not one person in this room got here today without some support. You got support. You got support. <laughs> you got support. That's right. That's right. Oprah Winfrey. No, Oprah Winfrey, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all have supports getting here. And so when we talk about disability rights, we're really talking about human rights. Right, right Michael? yes. Yes, we're talking about human rights because disability rights are human rights and people don't understand that. So, yes, you know, and supports are needed for everything. So, I'm Mike and um, my pronouns are he, him, and I, I'll be speaking later. So, but I got, I got kind of like, can I be part of this discussion? <laughs> so. yes, is the answer. <laughs> Yeah, you are assisting. Thank you. <laughs> My disability is not knowing when to shut up. So <laughs> I thank you all. Um, yeah, so as we, we're going to go through this today. And uh, as Greg said, not one of us has gotten anywhere that we are today without assistance, uh, whether it's someone taking notes for you or taking notes on your phone or wearing glasses or emotional support or your animals or whatever it is. We all have these things without them our lives would be infinitely more difficult, yes? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to add, oh, yeah, one, okay, two. go ahead. 
one thing that another thing is that people don't understand is there's a thing on your TV called closed captioning. And even if you're not deaf, you can turn those captions on. And if you can't understand some of the things they're saying, those captions give perfect descriptions sometimes. Yeah. And they're even using that in some theaters now because people either have a hard time hearing or they're deaf. And it's a thing that comes right to their phone and it can be a perfect thing. So. Or you have ADHD and you need to hear it and read and it read at it. the same time so your brain can put all those words and parts together. And people in the autism community enjoy that at conferences through the CART system because it's not exactly closed captioning, but it's people typing either in the room, typing what's being done, or they're typing via hearing the audio coming through the microphone. So. I, I just wanted to add that I think that it's kind of interesting to look through history and think about the things that were probably developed to assist people with disabilities that we all use, Texting. right? Texting, like, oh, do you, I, many of you might have been old enough to remember um, a thing called the TT, um, TTY, um, which is the teletypewriter um, that would convert, like, audio phone into text and the deaf community was using that for years and then it was like wait a minute why doesn't everybody use that the other thing that i love to video talk about phone. oh video phone yeah video phone right and the other thing that i love to, to talk about is is um you know we had this like thing i don't know if you remember at the covid pandemic you know <laughs> And it was so interesting to me because, you know, Mike and I work on this um, grant together that's like uh, for disability access and, and, and training people. And, um, and we get stories from people. And I remember like there would be stories of parents who had a child who was maybe immunocompromised or like had some disability. And they had to fight and fight and fight to be able to mm -hmm. access school from home. Mm -hmm. Like it was like you had to have a freaking act of Congress to do that. Then suddenly the pandemic happens and suddenly that assistance was available and free for everybody to use. Isn't that interesting that we were saying that we couldn't do it before, but then once something mm -hmm. happens, we realize, oh my gosh, this is something that we all need. And it just shows you that you know, disability rights is really about all of us. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say, I don't like to, you know, uh, like how do you say somebody who's non-disabled or something like that? I just like to call you all, you know, if you're non-disabled, temporarily, able. temporarily <laughs> able, that's right. <laughs> and another thing is, able. <laughs> yes. if you don't have a disability, you can become disabled or, you know, and you can have multiple disabilities because some people will like, you know, are affected or not affected, but, have things that happen, you know, like me, I had spinal meningitis as a baby, but I had a brain injury, and now I also have high blood pressure, so, you know, you never know how things are affect. And some people are visible, some are not. You know, if you look at me, you probably think, well, he's not, but, you know, it affects people differently, so. All right. And I think sometimes we, sometimes we, we get so caught up on disabilities being physical that we forget that mental illness is also a disability and that things like hyperactivity disorders are also a disability and that people's brains don't work the same way that yours do. So this continued societal expectation that we ex exist and perform the same ways that quote unquote average people do does nothing but damage people who don't think like you. And the older I get and the more friends I get who have um, some kind of disability like ADHD, I recognize that probably 50% of the people I know think just like I do, but we're expected to change the way that they think to fit someone else's standards. So just something to think about. Like you said, disabilities are not always physical. They can't always be seen with the naked eye. So kindness. Yeah. That's it, what do you have to say? Should we do our tap number now? <laughs> yeah, nailed it. That was it. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to introduce um, 
our guest, Mike Thornton. And, um, and we're going to basically have a conversation. But there's a little bit of a technical, I'm hearing voices right now. I hope other people might be hearing them as well. Okay, good. All right, so here's a little story. So when our daughter, Maddie, was little, she asked, why does evil exist in the world? All right, yeah, she has always been a philosophical thinker, but I didn't take this question lightly as her dad. I really, really thought about my answer. Now, I know you use don't tend to think about terms like um, evil <laughs> in the way that you know, other religions do, but I think we know what is meant by that, right? I mean, we can generally agree that genocide, like what happened in World War II Germany, was really, really bad. Uh, evil is a pretty good word for that. So as I thought about it more, my answer came out. Hmm. Because we care. Evil exists because we care. If we didn't care about stuff, then we simply wouldn't call bad things that happen to that stuff evil. Take, for instance, a family of mice move into your house. Many of you might be concerned about diseases causing your family sickness, or you might be worried that the mice will begin chewing on wires and breaking appliances or other things in your house. So you might decide to buy mouse traps and mouse poison to get rid of them. And from your perspective, you might consider those mice evil little creatures, right? Because what you care about is your house and your family. But from the mice's perspective, you are definitely the evil one here. I mean, you are trying to destroy their entire family, so it's pretty obvious from their perspective. So many years after Maddie asked that big question, she was actually enrolled in an ethics class in college, and she came across an ethical theory by Carol Gilligan that talked about this stuff, and it's called the ethics of care. The ethics of care basically has four main points. Okay, so the first one is attention. You can only care about things that you pay attention to. This brings up the famous quote from Albert Schweitzer that we often hear in the UU congregations. Think occasionally of the suffering of which you spare yourself the sight. You can only care about things that you attend to. The next principle in this is responsibility. So when we find ourselves in positions of relative power, we have a responsibility to use that power to help advocate for those with less power. That's responsibility. So attention, responsibility. The third point is competence. So in order to function ethically, we must constantly be learning how to care for others. Because we can't just follow the golden rule, we must follow the platinum rule. The platinum rule is treat others how they want to be treated or how they need to be treated. This requires listening to those that we care for, okay? And the fourth principle is responsiveness. And this one pertains to how we respond when we have been cared for. And that just means recognizing that care and expressing gratitude to those who care for us. This is the ethics of care, and I think it's beautiful. I really do. So. That's the ethics of care, and it's central to the topic that Mike and uh, I am going to be talking about today, because so much of the disability rights movement, and really all civil rights movements, to be honest, are really about paying attention, using your power to be an ally to empower others, and listening and learning how to help and how to not help people, right? So. Back to that original question. You know how we brought up the really 
evil thing that happened during World War II, the Jewish genocide? Well, that evil was fueled by a scientific field called eugenics. And eugenics pushed the notion that so-called undesirable traits of humans would spread and proliferate to future generations if those traits weren't stopped in their tracks. And this field of study actually didn't begin in Germany. It began here in the US. And it wasn't just used against Jewish people. It was used against LGBTQ plus people. And it was used, and unfortunately is still used today, against disabled people. For more on that topic, I really um, would recommend the book Neurotribes, which is about the history of the neurodiversity movement um, from the beginning of the discovery of autism um, all the way up into today and how that has evolved and how that discovery of aut autism started in the World War II Germany. It's a really fascinating book. And also a little bit of shorter book called Why Fish Don't Exist, which is mind-blowing, that book. So, just like there are terms for devaluing of people based on race, like racism, and sexual orientation, like homophobia, there is a term for this concept as it applies to disabled people. It's called ableism. And ableism manifests itself in numerous ways. Um, like forcing autistic people to hide their autism to make others in the room more comfortable, or refusing to make public spaces accessible to disabled people, or only providing supports for abled people, um, you know, like we talked about today during Time All Together. We all use supports to get through our day, cars, cell phones, alarm clocks, calendars to schedule appointments, reading glasses, etc. Our first principle is that we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I don't know. That sounds like a pretty sound rejection to eugenics and to ableism. But it all starts with paying attention, not only to others, but to ourselves. Where could we, as a church, provide better supports that would allow all people to feel a sense of acceptance and belonging here. Now, with that question lingering out there, I would like to introduce my good friend, Mike Thornton. Um, I work with Mike on a training grant called the LEND grant. The LEND, LEND stands for Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. And I coordinate the speech language pathology trainees and Mike coordinates the self-advocacy trainees. So he is in charge of helping people with experience living as a disabled person in Arkansas learn to ad advocate for other disabled people and families. Mike regularly goes to meet with state and national legislators to form policies to support disabled people. Mike is a dear friend of mine. Uh, a few years ago, we actually visited Capitol Hill together um, and we talked to some of our state uh, senators and representatives, and um, he somehow got us into a Bernie Sanders press conference. <laughs> and and um, one of the coolest things that I can say about Mike, though, is that he always gets my pronouns right. <laughs> <laughs> which really can't be said for most people. So it's, it's really amazing. So please help me uh, and welcome my good friend, Mike Thornton. Thank you, Greg. All right, All right. so I have some questions for Mike and he's just gonna riff off of these and like, you know. <laughs> Go, go rogue here. So, okay, so tell us a little bit about your own story and how you got involved in the work. Okay, first of all, I um, found my voice after the ADA um, event. So I was always a person that knew I had disability. Um, I was bullied in school. I was called the R word, which I'm not gonna say. Um, you probably know it um, and things. So I found my voice um, 
a professor at UALR actually helped me find my voice, and they encouraged me to, um, she encouraged me to write down a story. That was one of Dr. Eisner's assignments anyway. Write your story down, write a personal story down. So I wrote Wait, my Wait, Torrin Isom? Yes, oh Dr. Torrin Isom. Love her. We still talk even in her retirement. In fact, I want to meet with her. Um, but um, they um, helped me write my story down, which I will send to Greg to send out. Um, it's about being called the old word, about sticks and stones, uh, breaking my bones. Um, anyway, um, I do wish I'd have been able to have my voice back then because I have met some amazing people that were actually part of the march and on the Capitol Hill march through other advocacy efforts and through what's called Americans, thought called ADAPT, and it's called Americans with Disabilities for Attendant Programs Today, formerly known as Accessible Public Transportation. That needs to, that is an amazing story how they literally 19 people got out of their wheelchairs and sat in front of two buses in, front, in Denver, Colorado, and that's why we have accessible buses today yes. in yes. public transportation. Um, anyway, they, um, um, I met them. Um, I have not yet the one that, the girl, which I want to meet her one of these days, but I met some people that were right behind her on the call, so. And so um, it's kind of interesting hearing their stories and their perspective. And I have got, I did get to meet Judy Human before she, um, several years ago at the 25th anniversary of the ADA. So I just sat there and listened to her pour into youth and also share her, share stories back then. So that's been an amazing trip. So uh, that's a little bit about myself. Yeah. Well, Thank and, you. and um, okay, so, this kind of gets us into the next question. Mm -hmm. You've gotten to meet some really amazing trailblazers and advocates mm -hmm. in the fight for disability rights. So what are some of the most important things you've learned from them? Uh, listen, listen, listen. Um, speak, but listen more intently to other people's stories. Tell, be, be willing to tell people's stories. Be willing to talk about, which we'll talk about this in a little bit, policy, why it matters to you as a person, um, to learn about policy matters. Um, my favorite person that I've got to meet and got to chill, uh, hang out with and listen to and stay with them is my friend Liz Weintraub. She works for the Association and University Centers on Disabilities, which is a program that's kind of over our program. Um, and Liz is a policy person. She's a person with disabilities. She's worked on Capitol Hill for four months in Century Run. Um, my brain is, I can't think of their name. Oh, Senator Bozeman? Not Bozeman, um, Pennsylvania Senator. Oh, Pennsylvania. Um, anyway, she's worked, in, <laughs> she's worked in his office in our, so for four months, so she's learned about it from the Hill perspective about disability policy and how that works. So she has a perspective outside of Capitol Hill and a perspective inside on Capitol Hill on how things work, um, which that's one of my dreams one of these days to work on the Hill to learn that side of policy. Um, but I've learned so many things from different people that um, it'd be hard to sit down or stand up and just say everything. So, but I've learned that um, the best thing is to just listen because you can speak and speak and speak, but if you don't hear what other people are saying, then you don't fully understand. So, yeah, and I think that that's something that we're really beginning to see is is people being recognized as experts for their life experiences, mm -hmm. not just for their education or training. And and that's the most important thing to say to do is to share with people your life experience because. They may never fully understand, but if you serve your life experiences, you know, then they can kind of understand where you're coming, know where you're coming from and what matters to you. I think, so so I, I have to share a really great experience I had when um, we went to this big, um, this big conference together called the Disability Policy Seminar. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I cannot tell you what a mind-blowing experience it was for me to sit in this audience. Um, it was a place where you had people like me who like had you know a doctorate or PhD or we were professors or like whatever, or like people who were like um, you know uh, 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 from all walks of life. But then there were also people in there with disabilities mm -hmm. and like people with physical disabilities, people with intellectual disabilities. And everybody would listen to these speakers and then, or we would have a discussion about some topic. And what was so fascinating, and it shouldn't have been fascinating. Like it shouldn't have been something that I, I, I noticed as something that was odd because it should be absolutely the way that we do things. But um, what I noticed was when, you know, a person, you know, with, um, with their PhD stood up or whatever and, and started speaking their mind or, or uh, ask a question or had a, an opinion about something. Everybody was very kind and respectful and listened and, and respected them. But then there were people with like intellectual disabilities or with speech issues that like, um, and they would stand up and or they would, they would raise their hand and they would begin speaking mm -hmm. and they were treated exactly as like mm -hmm. almost better experts almost and they were listened to with much more reverence and it was just like whoa this is how it should be done like this is how it should be done so and, i thought that was and that's the one thing in AUCD we're getting better at it um i've noticed since the years that i was the first trainee and beyond and now i'm part of the AUCD board of directors so that's our emphasis is you know, to learn from the people with experience, lived experience, because, and I've noticed at our last conference last year, there were so many more people with disabilities, whether they were the self-advocate training or some other training in another area, or, you know, that, you know, there are so many people now involved with, that have disabilities and lived experiences. So it's getting more and more on that learned experience side. So. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have just uh, maybe one more question okay. that we have time for. Um, okay, I think um, I think of this question: What are some key things that you wish more people understood about disability advocacy, how to okay. treat people with disabilities, all of that stuff? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, do we have time for about <laughs> three or four hours? <laughs> The main thing is that you may have a disability and your, per your disability may, some other person may have a disability, but each person ha that lives with a disability is completely different from the next. And the autism community, and it applies to other disabilities, if you meet one person with autism, you meet one person with autism because each person is different. Each person has their own life experiences that they've had. And so you don't understand completely. Now speaking for people with disabilities, um, you can do that, but understand that you may not have the same experiences. So if you speak for people, realize that you're just speaking for people, but be careful because that your voice doesn't become louder than the people with disabilities. Let their voice be the biggest voices in the room. So that's the main thing that I want, I want to say. And one last thing, mm -hmm. um, also in the disability community, and my friend Liz said this in testimony uh, a few years ago in the Senate, all means all with disability. And one, faint, one last quote, it's from Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin, Martin Luther King, and that is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's my favorite quote to remember. So, thank you. Greg. Oh, another quote that I love that has been a, an anthem in the disability community is nothing about us nothing without about us. Nothing about us without us. Yeah. So. Like, nothing about us without us. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, are, if you are about to make changes or policies or, or anything to benefit the disability community, bring people in that know that perspective and listen to mm -hmm. them and treat them as the experts and 
pay them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for yes. that. Yeah, that's the thing. You can ask for things, but you know, people with disabilities have the professional experience, professional experience that is important. So you know, so if you can do that, you know, whether it's financially or food or whatever, you know, that's the best thing to do. You know, so. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you, everyone. And now I invite Rebecca back up to extinguish our chalice. Please join in saying our closing words, which are in the order of service. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. Our teaching is love and we practice it through fellowship. Please join us for a friendly cup of coffee and friendly conversation in Thomas Hall in the Meadow Wing following the service. Feels wrong after we sing that song. I know, right? <laughs> the light we carry it within us. Yeah.